So this is meant as a video response to my own Intel Core i5 overclocking guide, which you should probably check out here if you haven't already seen it, and then come back. I'll wait. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to wait. But seriously, this time we've gone with a slightly different platform. We've changed to a Gigabyte P55 UD4P, and we're going to be focusing more on the details of overclocking your Core i5 with a Gigabyte board versus what we looked at in the other video. So I just want to talk a little bit about why we chose this board. Now you retain most of the very important features like SLI, Crossfire support, you've got your dual channel DDR3 support, you've got a nice uh, beefy eight phase power delivery system with nice cooling on it, all of that good stuff, but at a much lower price point because you do lose some of the extras and bells and whistles. So stay tuned, we're going to show you how to get the most out of your Core i5 with this sweet board. So there was a wee bit of confusion in our last uh, overclocking guide as to what's an i5, what's an i7. So I'm pulling out the NTT WB, the NCIX Tech Tips whiteboard here, and I'm just going to cover the basics. So what we had before was the i7-900 series. So those are on LGA 1366, so the older platform, and they are not available on the new platform P55. Now there are i7s available. We've got the i7-800 series. Those are available on 1156, but not on LGA 1366. Now the difference between these two i7s is that the top one has support for triple channel memory, and the bottom one does not. Now, also available on 1156 is the i5-700 series, not available on 1366. The only difference between the i5-700s and the i7-800s is hyperthreading, and they're clocked slightly lower. So overclocking on a gigabyte board is super easy. That's why they call it MIT, because you need to have gone there in order to do it. <laughs> I hope he puts a laugh back in there. Anyway, so the MIT uh, settings. Let's start with the advanced frequency settings. So what we're going to do, this board seems to like a little bit better if I turn down the, the clock ratio. So we're going to go with a 20x CPU multiplier or clock ratio. Now advanced CPU core features, we're going to turn off the usual suspects. So we're disabling C1E, that's a power saving feature, disabling turbo boost, and we are disabling EIST or speed step. Next thing, we're at the QPI clock ratio, we're turning that down to the lowest, so that's X32. For base clock, we're going to go, yes, we do want to control the base clock. We're going to turn it up to 185, 185. So we're going to target an end frequency of about 3.7 gigahertz, the same as we did in our first guide. We're not going to use XMP, it is a little bit on the buggy side in my experience. We're turning our memory multiplier down to 8. So it's a little bit on the lower side, better safe than sorry for memory as far as I'm concerned. Advanced memory settings. So I tend to stick with uh, standard performance enhancing features because they can cause compatibility problems. And then for voltages. Now this board, I really like the way it handles voltages. It does overvolt a little bit, but it'll do it automatically for the most part. So if you just enable load line calibration, which is uh, a feature that disables VDroop, it'll actually turn up the voltage of your CPU enough to keep it stable for quite a fair bit of overclocking. So we'll be back as soon as we're booted back up here. So just like our other guide, we're showing you our, our end result, which is a 3.7 gigahertz overclock. So if I can get the cameraman to have a look. Now this board didn't like sticking with its default multiplier of 21x. It preferred that we drop the multiplier and raise the base clock, which is just fine because that's good for performance anyway. Now you can see here we have eight instances of Prime 95. Now we are running an i7-860. So that's why we have hyperthreading, but the procedure is pretty much the same if you're running an i5-750. Now then you can also see in core temp our CPU temperatures are a little bit higher than they were on the other board and like I mentioned before the gigabyte board will guess the voltages for you but it does guess a little bit on the high side so it will run a little hot. Anyway thank you for checking out part two of our Core i5 overclocking guide.